Hi everyone, I'm Carlisle, one of the pastors at Journey Church. Thanks for joining us together in worship on Sunday morning, no matter where you are in your living room, wherever you are watching, doing a watch party, whatever it is, we appreciate that you're making worship a priority. I got to go away for a couple of days at the beginning of the week on a spiritual retreat. I just go away by myself, I went camping. I've tried to make that a discipline over the years of my life so that I can be alone with God and hear from Him and so I can learn to be well with myself. And I have learned that I can only handle about a day and a half of that. Not because I get tired of hearing from God, but I do get tired of hearing from me. And then I gotta get back to my people. I gotta get back to my wife and, and my dogs, which aren't people, but then I get to get back to my people, people that I'm in community with and church with. You know what's so exciting? Is that on August 30th, we get to get back with our people together on Sunday morning at 10.30. 30% capacity in our auditorium. We are so excited to start to come back together. So we wanted to let you get ready for that. We want you to know that you need to pre-register for that in the auditorium so that we can be at 30%. We'll also have our Journey Kids at 30%. You need to register your kids separately. And then we also have Journey students on Sunday at five o'clock in the afternoon and you need to pre-register them too. So we're just getting geared up for that. When uh, things start to settle up a little bit more, we'll add in Saturday night back in. And when things start to get even more safe, then we'll add our nine o'clock Sunday morning service. So look forward to that. That'll take us up through the fall, we're pretty sure. We just can't wait to get back together in person or online because everything, what we experience at Sunday morning in the auditorium, you will experience online at home as well. A couple of other things to mention to you. Journey groups are super important to us. We, relationships at Journey Church are important. Relationship with God and relationships with each other. One place that you can monitor both of those and invest in God and invest in yourself and invest in your community is in a journey group. We do journey groups during the week in people's homes and in the church, and you can sign up for those today. You can go to our website and look for those, see one that attracts you, that fits your schedule, and start joining up in those groups. The other thing that I wanna mention before we get into worship is we have our Connect card online. We enjoy hearing from you about that, what's going on in your life, things that we could be praying with you about. Or as we hear from Pastor David today, if there's something that really drives into your heart, then we love to hear about those things. So take some time and fill those out. And also, we appreciate your generosity. We're getting through the COVID slump and through the summer slump, gearing up to do all the ministry that we get to do together this fall. So you can give online, the instructions should be there. So would you pause for a moment? Let's get ready to worship to God and then we'll hear from God. Would you close your eyes and bow your head and let's pray together. Jesus, we thank you so much that you are involved in our life from day to day. Even the things that we are unsure of, things that we don't like, you are involved in those things. And we wanna keep learning from you today as we get into the next section of First Peter in our All In series. Jesus, may we hear from you so that we know how to move forward into the things that you have for us. We love you, Jesus. We love to worship you. We love to hear from you. We love to live with you. It's in your name that we pray, amen. Mm -hmm. 
Hey, good morning, Journey Church. Uh, Welcome back to week five of our All In series. Can I just stop for a minute and say how incredible that worship was? Can we give our amazing worship team a hand just for who they are? Like, seriously, like, as J-Lo would say on World of Dance, it gave me goosies, you know? I got the J-Lo goosies in that. It was awesome. And so what a privilege it is to continue worship in a time where the church is scattered. And this is what we've said from the beginning is the church is not closed. We're just a little bit disrupted and we are going to figure out how to make a way for our God to be worshiped and the gospel to be proclaimed. And so I'm excited to get back on August 30th, but I'm also incredibly proud of our church and how we've handled and navigated this difficult time. And one of the things I think Peter has helped us with that. And so we're going to continue uh, looking at Peter's instruction for the church. So open up your Bibles to 1 Peter chapter 4. If you got your phone, you can flip it on and scroll over there. And here's what we're talking about today. Peter is training the church how to think like Jesus in the midst of suffering. All right. I know we don't love to talk about suffering. It's not something that we get really excited about, but the church is under major duress during the time that Peter wrote this. Persecution is at an all-time high. The church is scattered. And to be honest, the church is freaking out. They're thinking, man, what did I sign up for? How do we handle this season of suffering? And Peter's uh, um, encouragement to the church is, hey, we need to think like Jesus when it comes to suffering. Now, I was thinking about this this week, and I thought about the phrase, um, misery loves company. You ever hear that phrase, you know, that idea that just misery loves company? You know, you meet those like grouchy people that love to hang out with grouchy people, you know, or the grouchy people that go into a room and want to make sure everybody else's time is ruined when they enter into the room. Just misery loves company. And I was thinking about a time um, my wife and my son, who's eight now, but he was about four or five at a time, were at the park. And my wife is like hanging out with all the park moms, you know, and trying to like, you know, make relationships and make friends. And, and all of that. And she looks up and she sees little sweet Moses with a handful of rocks, chucking rocks at the kids as they're running by. And Tara's freaking out. She's like, what in the world is Moses doing? So she runs up, she grabs him, she gets all the rocks out of his hand, takes them home, and then brings, her, brings Moses home to me, tells me the story of what's going on. And I do what any good father would do is I ask the most important question. How is this throwing arm? Right? I want to make sure he can be a pitcher, right? I want to make sure he's hitting his target, that you know, the, the rocks are flinging hard enough. And then once I found that out, I got over it and I looked at Mo and I said, Mo, what's going on? Why'd you do that? And in Mo's sweetest little voice, he said, Well, the other kids wouldn't play with me. And I was like, oh man, that hurts when that happens, right? When you're rejected and people don't want to want to hang out with you, that hurts your feelings, doesn't it? And I said, so why why throw rocks at him? And he said this, in the sweetest way, he goes, I just wanted them to hurt too. And it was just this moment, Moses didn't know what to do with suffering. He was in a moment where he was suffering rejection, he was suffering separation, he was suffering being different and on the outside, and he didn't know what to do with that suffering. And if I'm going to be honest, I think a lot of people in the church struggle with that too. What do we do in the midst of our suffering? Now, Frederick Nietzsche said this super famous line, and he said, to live is to suffer, right? And he was like your, your ultimate nihilist, right? He's not a philosopher you really want to follow because everything's doom and gloom with them. But this was actually said in a positive way, and here's what he meant. His, the point he was trying to make was this. If human beings don't figure out what to do with suffering, life is going to be miserable for them. People cannot figure out how to live a good life if we don't figure out what to do with suffering. Why? Because we all suffer. We all experience suffering in our lives. And the older you get, the more you suffer, right? Like sometimes I'm like at the age now, well, I'll wake up from a nap suffering body aches and pains just from age, right? Just from aging because of my oldness, you know? And, but but we, we suffer with broken relationships. We suffer in strained marriages. We suffer in, um, in looking at what's going on in the world with poverty and division. And suffering is just a part part of the reality of the human condition. And if we don't learn how to make sense of suffering, 
then we will either have to live paralyzed by fear, spending all of our days trying to avoid suffering, or spend our lives crushed by disappointment, right? We have to figure out what do you do with suffering? And so Peter invites us to think like Jesus when it comes to suffering. Now, we know that Jesus knows a thing or two about suffering, doesn't he? He does. Like, Jesus walked on this earth and he suffered in every way that we suffer. He was betrayed by one of his homies, right? One of his best, like, disciples, the guy that was handling all the money, like, betrayed him. And not just, like, betrayed him over Facebook or a text, actually betrayed him with a kiss, right? Like, this dude, he was betrayed by Jewish. He, he, uh, Judas. He was mocked. He was spit on. He was scorned. He was misunderstood. Like, Jesus understood suffering. And then not only that, he suffered to the point of death. He was brutally murdered on a cross, the most torturous way someone could die ever, like ever, like not even like back then, like ever, the cross was the worst way that someone could die. So Jesus knows a thing or two about suffering. And Peter's going to take some time to tell the church to look to Jesus as an example when it comes to how do we, as the people of God, how do we deal with the issue of suffering in our lives. So we're going to look at that. Now, the question that we have to ask ourselves is, what do we do when floods of disappointment come your way? What do you do? How do you respond? And I think there's three ways that we can respond in suffering. One is we could let the flood of disappointment carry us downstream, right? When it washes over us. Here's what I mean. What we can do is we can look to the world for comfort and escape. Right? And people do that all the time. They experience suffering, and so they go to maybe drugs or alcohol or maybe pornography, or maybe they look to toxic relationships to try to escape the pain that they're feeling. Right? People all the time go to the things of the world to try to escape the painful condition of suffering. Or you can just let the flood of disappointment drown you, right? take you out, like keep, you, keep you down and not doing anything. Or I think there's a third way. Right? We can learn with Jesus how to swim upstream. How do we go against the grain of culture in the midst of difficulties? See, I believe the gospel is designed to be the power that helps us to swim upstream. Right? And I don't have a clever uh, name for this sermon, but I was trying to think of one really hard after Carlisle's amazing uh, name with you know, flies in a world of vinegar, or attracting flies with honey in a world of vinegar, or attracting flies with a bottle of vinegar in a world of honey that doesn't have that. But it was an amazing, it was an amazing title that we had last week. I couldn't think of it. So I just titled this message, Think Like Jesus. All right, that's, that's all I could come up with this week when I did that. But I want us to look at that. And here's what Peter does. When it comes to suffering in this world, Peter points back to Jesus, and he starts the conversation back in chapter 3, verse 18. And and, and I want you to look at this. He starts this conversation about how do we swim upstream as the people of God in the midst of difficulties, in the midst of suffering. And he says this in 1 Peter 3, verse 18. He says, for Christ suffered once for sins. And listen, he's talking about the brutality of the cross, right? Like he he suffered to the point of death, but he did it for a very specific reason. He did it for sins. Christ suffered for your sin and for my sin. And he goes on to explain it, the righteous for the unrighteous, right? He was the righteous one. Not only did he suffer, but he suffered without reason for suffer, for suffering. He didn't deserve it. He was perfect in every way, yet he handed himself over to suffering with a purpose, righteous for the unrighteous. And then here's the big purpose. He says that he might bring us to God. I love that. Jesus was willing to suffer so that we could know God, so that we would no longer suffer in our sin, but that we would be brought to God and reconciled and being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. And so here's what Peter does when it comes to suffering. He reminds us of of two really important things, that Jesus' suffering had a purpose. 
right? The purpose was one, reconciliation. He was willing to go through suffering so others could know that God is real and that God loves them and that there is a way to God, but also restoration. He also suffered so that the Holy Spirit can take the sin-sick heart of an unbeliever and make it come alive in Christ, right? We, we get this, uh, this heart where we're replaced, our heart of stone is replaced with a heart of flesh and blood, where we're no longer given over to our own ways and sin, Satan, and death, but our heart can now beat to the rhythm of God's grace. So Peter wants us to know that Christ suffered, but not for no reason. There was a reason for Jesus's suffering. And then he says this in chapter four, verse one, and this is where we're at today. He says this, since Christ suffered in the flesh, since Christ did this in the flesh, arm yourselves with the same way of thinking. Think like Jesus. How do we take this reality of suffering and think like Jesus? And then he makes this crazy statement. He says, for whoever has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. And here's the first thing I think Peter wants us to see in this suffering reality that we all exist in. God will never allow your suffering to go to waste. He won't. Like, that's the thing. And he's saying, look, Christ suffered, and he suffered as bad and worse than any of us will ever and have ever suffered because not only did he suffer the brutality of the cross, but then he suffered the wrath of God to take away the sins of the world, the thing that you and I will never have to go through because of Jesus Christ. And God used his suffering for glory and good. Now, God is not the author of suffering. God hates it. He hates suffering our suffering, but it is the reality that we have to live in in a broken world. It just is, right? Like, you know, God did not design a world where cancer devastates the body. God did not design a world where marriages break up, right? And, and that covenant relationship splits apart. God did not design a world to have abstract poverty and death because people can't get clean water. God hates suffering. But while we wait for the not yet reality of the kingdom to come, this is where we're at. This is the devastating effects of sin in the world. And so God makes a promise that, that even though he hates suffering and there will be a day where suffering has ceased, ceased, we still have to go through it as his people. And so his promise is he's not gonna let your suffering go to waste. Every tear that we shed, I love this passage of scripture. It says that God keeps in a bottle right? Remembering our sorrows, like he's near us in our sorrows. He'll never let our suffering go to waste. And I've seen that just this week. We had a couple in our church who their, their little one had a medical emergency and was, was um, intubated. Is that the right word? I'm not a medical guy, so sorry about that. But um, basically had tubes going in. They were worried. They didn't know if he was going to make it through. And the global church, people from all around the world started praying for little James Johnson. And you know what? Within hours, he was healed. Now listen, God didn't love that suffering. But he wasn't going to let it go to waste because I'll tell you what, when I heard the news that James had recovered, my heart praised Jesus. God was worshiped in that moment. He wasn't going to let little James' suffering go to waste. He was going to use that suffering for his own glory. And that's what he does. And so, so that's, what, that's what Peter's saying. Arm yourself with the same way of thinking, right? Jesus accomplished some stuff with suffering. Maybe your suffering, our suffering that we go through in this world, maybe it can accomplish some good too. Maybe not only does it do something in us, but maybe it does something in others as they see us suffer well as believers in Jesus Christ. So that's the first thing I think Peter is, is pointing us to. But the second thing is he says this, for whoever has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. Now, that's a very weird phrase, right? You read that and you're like, what in the heck does that mean? And it doesn't mean that we are going to be sinless on this side of eternity. That's not what Peter is saying. Like, if you suffer enough, right, then you will one day be sinless, right? Don't, I, my wife has suffered enough and she can still attest to my sinfulness. Like, you will, it's not going to happen on this side of eternity, right? That's not what he's saying. But listen to what he's saying. Even if you suffer to the point of death, it's okay because on the other side of this life is a new life where we'll be in the presence of God without sin. So do you, 
Do you see what Peter's saying? He's saying, Jesus realized, and, and here's how I say it, that our best life is not meant to live, be lived now, right? You know, there's, there's a book that was floating around. It's like, live your best life now. You know, there's another book that said like, you know, buy the shoes, eat the cookie. You know what I mean? It's like, it's this, it's this um, trap, right? Where people want to believe that we can live the best life now. But let me tell you something. If this is your best life, if you're striving to live your best life now, you need to get a bigger picture of the kingdom of God because it's beautiful. And one day, things are going to be made right. One day, the new kingdom's gonna settle in on earth. And one day, the, the, the presence of sin is going to be, be flee from God's presence. And one day, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And one day, there will be no more wars. And one day, there'll be no more divorce. And one day, there'll be no more sickness and pain. And one day, God will wipe every tear. That's the promise of the life to come. See, for a believer, for one in Christ, Peter was reminding the church that this is as bad as it gets for us. This is as bad as it gets, right? The suffering that we experience now one day will lead to death and we will be resurrected and we will be in the presence of Jesus. We will walk with Jesus face to face in the coolness of the new Jerusalem garden and we will be with the creator of, of all things, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And he's saying, look, we need to make sure that that is our desire. Now listen, God loves you and he wants good for you and he wants you to live a, a good life. He wants you to flourish. He even promises us this John 10, 10 abundant life. But listen, it's not gonna be found in the things of this world. And that's the trap to think that we can actually have the John 10, 10 abundant life, the kingdom life without the king. It's not gonna happen. And so he says this in verse two. Look at this with me. He says, for whoever has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. So this, so as to live the rest of the time in the flesh, no longer for human passions, but for the will of God. And Peter's saying, look, because this is not our best life now, because there's another life coming, we no longer have to pursue the things of this world, we can pursue the things of the coming kingdom. We can pursue the world to come and we can spend our life not on ourself and our fleshly passions. We can spend our life on God's kingdom and God's will. That's what this is. And listen, we all have human passions, don't we? We all have desires. You know, and we gotta, we gotta be clear because sometimes Christians call like suffering, like things that are suffering, it's not really suffering. Like, like, oh, someone was rude to me in the line of McDonald's. You know, they must hate Christians. You know what I mean? And that's like, that's not suffering. Or, oh my gosh, I have to drive a 98 Toyota Corolla and I really want a Lexus. You know what I mean? I'm suffering for Christ. You know, that is not the type of suffering they were talking about. He's talking about suffering for going against the grain of culture. And listen, Jesus had to wrestle with this. This is a human thing, right? Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane. He was getting ready to go to the cross. And you might remember the story where he's asking his boys to pray for him. And they're like tired and sleepy and don't stay up. And he's in there wrestling with God saying, God, is there any other way? Like, do I have to suffer? Is there any other way to accomplish your will? And he wrestles his desire. The humanity of Christ wrestles his desire into submission to God's will. That's what he did in the garden. And, and it was such a strong wrestle that he actually sweat great drops of blood. That's what it said. It was so stressful and so intense and he was fighting the flesh so much that he actually started sweating blood. Like, that's what I feel like when I go to the gym. I know I don't, but like, that's how intense, right, his wrestling with the flesh is. We all have that. And we have to think about what does it look like to wrestle the flesh into submission to God's will in our lives. I love the way Eugene Peterson puts this. He says, since Jesus went through everything you're going through and more, this is his, his paraphrase of verse one and two. Since Jesus went through everything you're going through and more, learn to think like him. Think of your sufferings as weaning from that old sinful habit of always expecting to get your own way. And then he says this, then you'll be able to live out your days free to pursue what God wants instead of being tyrannized by what you want. 
See, a lot of our suffering that we experience is just our unwillingness to submit to the will of God. And we're tyrannized by our fleshly desires. That's what Eugene Peterson's saying. We're haunted by them, right? We, we struggle through them. And instead of learning how to wean off of our fleshly desires and, and, and pursue what God wants instead of what we want. Now, R.C. Sproul divided theology up into two categories. And he said there's two types of people in the world. There's people who have dog theology and people who have cat theology, okay? So how many cat people do we got in the room? How many people love cats, all right? We got a couple and then a couple of reluctant ones that didn't want to admit it, so that's okay. <laughs> I know you're probably, you're probably there too. And then we have, we have dog people. How many dog people in the room? Yeah, oh yeah, dog people are loud people, right? They, they love their dogs. Yeah, I, you got it. I'm, I'm, a, I'm just not even an animal person, so if you didn't like me, just you don't like me even more now. But never even been an animal person. But uh, he broke this up into two types of theology, dog theology and cat theology. And here's what he said. He said, um, dog theology is this. Dogs to their owners, they, 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 they look at their owner and they say, man, you pet me, you feed me, you rub my belly, you put, a, you, you, know, you put a roof over my head, you give me love when I need love, you greet me like with joy when you come in the door. You do all of those things, therefore you must be God, right? They worship you, right? Dogs worship their owners. Now, cat theology, they say, you feed me, you pet me, you give me water, right? Therefore, I must be God, right? <laughs> Cats strut around like they own the place, right? Like they're the God and you're just like their little minions bidding, you know, everything that they want and desire. But sometimes as humans, we have to decide, do we have cat theology or dog theology? Are we like children that are eager to worship the Father or are we like cats that are running around trying to get God to do our own bidding? And this is what Peter's doing. He's helping us rearrange our theology and our understanding. And so in verse 3, he, he breaks it down and he talks about what living after the passions of your own flesh looks like here. And it says this, For the time that is past suffices for doing what the Gentiles want to do. And this is what, it, what, what, what that literally means. Enough. Enough is enough, church. Like pursuing your own way and your own will and all your fleshly desires, enough is enough. Like time has already passed. You already had your fun. Now it's time to get serious about faith in God, about following him and what he's doing, right? Especially in these times. And he says, uh, uh, doing what the Gentiles want to do, living in sensuality, living in passions, living in drunkenness, living in orgies, drinking parties, and lawless idolatry, right? This is what pursuing the flesh is. And I know you guys are looking at me and going, David, I don't have orgies, you know? I know that's really weird. Awkward. Like, you're not saying that. You're like, I, don't, I haven't had a drinking party. Like, I go to bed at 7 o'clock, 6 o'clock, you know? Like, I watch two shows and that's it. Listen, in that time, things were much different, but what Peter is doing is giving us this grotesque picture of self-indulgence. You see, we might not have those things going on, but do we live a life that completely and utterly terminates on the self? Because the gospel is meant to challenge the status quo. We might not go to drunkenness parties, but we can be drunk on things. Entertainment, power, consumerism, keeping up with the Joneses, we can be drunk on anger. We can be drunk on bitterness. We can be drunk on all kinds of things. And what he is saying, there is a type of suffering that Christians experience from going against the grain of culture, from being sober-minded about life and what the will of God actually is for the church. Now, listen, I know what it's like to, to go against um, the grain of culture. Like, sometimes it's like a just not doing what you want to do. Like right now my wife is on a diet and so she's eating a different, um, she's like eating different foods and like a good husband, I'm not on the diet with her, which makes it seven <laughs> times more harder for her to do that, right? And so she'll be like starving at the dinner table and I'm like eating a burrito with like cheese and beans like dripping out of my face because I'm a great husband. That's what I do. <laughs> Just kidding. I actually started going on the diet with her, so I, she, she won me over. But it's hard, right? When you see someone doing something that you can't have, that you want, even good things, 
right? Good thing. There's nothing wrong with driving a nice car or having, you know, a, a good food or nice meals or stuff or fancy clothes. There's nothing wrong with those things. But for whatever reason, when your priorities are different and you can't have them, all of a sudden it's like enticing, isn't it? And that's what Peter's saying. He's saying, don't get fooled by the worldly desires. Lay them down. And so Peter makes a distinction. And he says this. Sim simply, he makes two distinctions. He says, there are two types of suffering that, that happen for Christians. You can, you can suffer because of righteousness. You can suffer in the world because you choose a different way. Right? You're choosing to diet from certain things that are just unnecessary. You're choosing to go against the grain of culture. You're choosing to make decisions that leverage your resources for the glory of God and not the glory of self. Or you can choose as suffering because of foolishness and selfishness. And, and you'll see this. Look in verse 12 and 14. He says this. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. And here's what he's saying. Man, don't be surprised when it's hard to not to go against the grain of culture because it's hard. Like we can't act like that's not hard. Like we're all holy and we have it all together. It's difficult to go against the grain of culture when everybody around you is living life for a specific end and, and in a specific way. It's hard to live differently in the midst of that. But he's saying, church, don't fall into that. But he says, but rejoice because you will suffer just because the spirit of the glory, uh, spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. He says, you know what? You're suffering because you're following God. You're suffering because the spirit of God is with you. But then he says this in verse 15. He says, but you can also suffer because of foolishness. And he says in verse 15, let none of you suffer as a murderer. And I know all of us are like, well, I'm, I'm out. I don't, I'll never suffer because of that. But let's hold on a minute. Because remember, Peter was discipled by Jesus. And you might remember that Jesus had a philosophy of murder that was different. Remember when he's talking about murder and, and lust? you know, and adultery. He's talking about murder and adultery. And he says, look, even if you have hatred in your own heart for someone else, you're a murderer. And he says, don't suffer because of hatred in your heart towards someone. And, and here's the deal. We are living in a politically divided time where it's easy to have an us versus them mentality, isn't it? It's easy to start harboring hatred in our hearts for people that don't think like us, that don't act like us, that don't want the same things for us, whether it be politically or socially or economically or whatever, isn't it? It's easy to, to become a murderer and not even know it. And he says, don't suffer as a murderer, a thief, or an evildoer, and then I love this last one, or as a meddler. You're like, murder, thief, evildoer, and then meddler. And really, it literally means busybody. Or I want to call it the social media troll, all right? Like some of you guys know what I'm talking about, right? Where you're just suffering because everybody has offended you and God has appointed you the one to go and correct everybody's understanding of politics and theology and life and the world around them. And so you're just the, 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 the suffering savior that's going to fix everybody's understanding of what the world should be right now, right? Some of us are suffering in that way right now. But don't suffer that way. That's what he's saying. And this, here's the call. In verse 19, he says this. So, therefore, don't suffer for foolishness sake, but suffer for righteousness sake. And in verse 19 says, therefore, let those who suffer for righteousness sake, who suffer according to God's will, let them entrust their souls to a faithful creator. And then listen, while doing good, even in the midst of our suffering, as we go against the grain, the church is not called to shrink back. It's not called to hide out. It's not called to, 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 to like wait it out and, and huddle up and wait until Jesus comes back. It's like, no, as you're suffering for going against the grain, make it every effort to do good. And then he defines that for us. I love it. Another way that uh, Paul says it in Galatians 6, 9, he says, let us not grow weary of doing good in the midst of suffering. For in due season, we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Right? And so what Peter is saying, look, I know things are hard. I know we're in a weird, volatile situation right now in the world. I know everybody is divided and we have all of these um, uh, weird uh, things going on in culture that make it difficult for people to live out their faith right now. But he's saying, church, don't stop doing good. 
right? There's good to be done. And then he goes on to define this good. And let me just read this for you in verses 7 and 11. He says this, the end of all things is at hand. Doesn't it kind of feel like the end of all things is at hand right now? Like, dude, you got, you know, like global like warming and you got like viruses and plagues and you got political division and upheaval like I'm literally just waiting for the antichrist to pop up any moment you know what I mean like it is strange it feels like the end of all things right now the church was in a season like that too in Peter's time it felt like the end of all things and he says this therefore be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers he's like look we got to sober up. We got to start thinking about things differently. What does it look like to pursue God with all of our hearts in this time, in this season? And he says this, do this. Above all, keep loving one another earnestly since love covers a multitude of sin. Show hospitality to one another without grumbling. And as each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's very grace. See, even in the midst of suffering, we can be a blessing to people. Have you, ever, have you ever met someone who's suffered well and it's just like astounding? We have a family who is struggling. The, the father is going through cancer and he's going through cancer treatment. He's actually doing really, really well. But when I moved here, he was right in the middle of it. And, and it was bad. And this family, when I got here, came to my door and brought me like gift cards and a basket of food and like welcomed us with donuts and like, it was like the most beautiful thing. And here is this family that's suffering sickness out of their control. They're dealing with their own things. And the first thing they thought about was to serve me, to love me. That does something for people's faith. That's encouraging in a crazy way. And so the first thing we do is love one another earnestly. And it says this, since love covers a multitude of, of sin, I think we underestimate the power of love. Like sin wounds, hurt people hurt people, but love heals. Right? And so even if we're having conflict with something, you know what Peter's asking us to do? To love them. And not just, this word earnestly is not just like honestly, it means with all your power in you. Even when you don't feel like loving them, with all your power and you muster up, love them. You know why? Because love covers a multitude of sin. And then he says this, and, and, and uh, he, says, he says, we don't just have a knee-jerk reaction of hate and response. We, we, we slow down and we learn to love one another well. I know, um, that's what I always say, I sit, sin will give us a thin skin and a thick heart, a hard heart. That's what sin does in our lives, right? It, it makes us sensitive towards everything, and then it hardens our heart towards compassion and love towards people that aren't like us. But do you know what love does? Love gives us a thick skin, right? We, we, we don't have to be offended by everything and a tender heart. We can show compassion to people that aren't like us or maybe even are mean to us or maybe even disagree with us vehemently, maybe even hate us for our beliefs, right? Think about loving someone like that. And the second thing is he says this, show hospitality without grumbling. And I love this one. We talk about grumbling a lot here in, in this text, but in this book. But what this means is when things get tough, there's a tendency to want to keep distance from one another, isn't there? Like, if I have a disagreement with you about something, my tendency is to shun you and keep separation from you. And Peter's saying, don't do this. Don't do that, church. Like, here's what I want you to do. I want you to invite people in. Invite each other in. Work out your differences. Don't separate from one another. Show hospitality and let them into your lives. And heart, love your enemies. Stop fighting with one another and start fighting for one another. And then he says the third thing. He says, and on top of that, in the midst of difficulties, use your gifts to serve one another. Serve, right? Don't let your gifts terminate on yourselves. Don't seek your own passions and pleasures. But everything we have is given to us by God so that we can steward God's glory. One of the best uh, or most impactful things I saw was about three years ago. And it stuck with me. It was this journalist that was going around Europe and he was looking at people doing good work, doing good deeds. And he was this um, 
he was this secular guy. He was actually an atheist that was interviewing all these people that were doing good things. And one, one guy, this Anglican minister, was um, opened up a furniture store for people who were getting out of prison, but like violent criminals like murderers and rapists and all of these things. And this, this like secular guy was so like almost mad at this minister for doing this. And he goes in, he interviews him. You can see him. He's just kind of smug, right? And he gets to the end of this interview and, and he says this. He's like, well, aren't you worried that all these people are just going to take advantage of you? Advantage of your kindness, advantage of your love, you know, advantage of your money and generosity. Aren't you just worried that these people are just taking advantage of you? And I, I kid you not, the minister, without skipping a beat, he looked this guy in the eye and he says this. He says, you can't take advantage where advantage is freely given. I thought, man, what if the church thought like that? What if the church no longer had to protect everything and be the guard of everything, but we just give advantage to one another? We give the benefit of the doubt of one another. Do you know that Jesus gave you an advantage? When he died on the cross, he took you from a state of disadvantage, right? You were condemned under the weight of your sin, and he put you in a place of advantage where now you have his glory and his righteousness. What if we looked at one another in the same way? What if we loved one another so passionately that we didn't see the sin, but we just saw an opportunity to love like Jesus loves us? Let's pray. Father. We thank you so much for your goodness and glory. We thank you for your word. God, in the midst of suffering, let us not suffer for foolishness. Let us not suffer for our own unrighteousness. God, let us suffer for doing good. Let us be a people who seek no longer to gratify the desires of the flesh, but live all of life all for your glory. God, we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, church, thanks for joining us. We will see you next week, same time, same place.